I think we would probably all agree, no one wants to be labeled an intolerant hater. That somehow that's who you are, that defines you. But I believe today in our country, more and more that's becoming the unifying principle. That we have to not just say it's okay, I mean, we want to live and let live, but that you must advocate and celebrate mm, this new understanding that's taking place in our world of marriage, of gender, of sexuality. Now, last week I began a, a new series called Foundational Biblical Truths. We're going to look at a few weeks, and we're going to be looking at the book of Genesis. We started last week. Now, we're doing this because we don't want to be intolerant, but we want to do what God has said. We want to follow what he has said as the creator, the sovereign creator, the sovereign sustainer of this world. He, because of who he is, has chosen a certain moral standard. And when we violate his standard, there's always ramifications. There's always difficult consequences that come through. And so last week we began looking at God. Genesis 1.1. God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when you pull out the foundational cornerstone of the edifice, the whole structure begins to crumble. And I submitted to you that that's exactly what we've done. That's what we're doing in our society. We don't want God to be any way part of it, any way, anyhow, except at church, and we've got to keep it real confined right here, right? And so the result of this is when you take him away, it doesn't mean that you start believing in anything but now that you believe in everything, as much as you can imagine anything, then that's what you can do. Because there's nothing to stop you. There's no standard. Today, we're going to look at God creates mankind. Last week, as we looked at God creating the world, we saw that he created the world in six days. And today, he's going to, on the sixth day... He's going to create mankind. There's three things we are told about this. The first thing is this, that mankind is created in God's image. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image and the in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The sixth day, six 24-hour days, not six long geological periods, but six literal days. And on day six, he creates the land creatures. And the last land creature that he creates is man. Now, if you go through chapter one, six times it says, then God said, Verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24. God said this, and then things happened, and then God said it was good. But now you come to verse 26, instead of then God said, now it becomes personal. Let us make mankind. Not just that man said, but let us. Personal. And as we saw last week, we talked about the Trinity. One God. One essence, but three different persons, not three different gods. And so right here he says, let us with the possibility of plurality. The Trinity, nobody can fully un unravel that, understand that. But progressive revelation, here God says from the very beginning, I am one God, but three persons. And he, throughout the rest of the Bible, the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Father, all God. Not three gods, but this is the beginning that we can see that he's laying this foundation. 
And God says that he created man. He didn't, man wasn't involved. He created man to have personal relationships. Now, that word man, the, the Hebrew word is Adam, where we get Adam from. Three different wa- ways it could be used. It could be used of mankind generic, mankind, man, woman, everybody in the world. Or it could be used a second way, man as distinct from woman. Or it can be used a third way, Adam, a personal name. Your name is Adam. And he says, let's create them in our image and our likeness. These are interchangeable words, parallel words, synonyms. These aren't image one way and likeness another, but he's using it as Hebrew often does. (laughs) Says something twice, excuse me. Repetition to get your attention. And so I think that image and likeness he's talking about is personhood. Now, what do I mean by personhood? I think there's a few facets to it. You think of personality. Personality as intellect, thinks, emotions, feels, and volition, chooses. God has that. We have that in his image. Second, though, when we talk about personhood, God created man with a moral sense of right and wrong. Every person's created with this. It's called the conscience. And that conscience is illuminated by the scripture to get exactly right. But every person knows basic right and wrong over time. If, if you don't listen to that, you sear your conscience and you become you know, a psychopath at the worst part. But every person has this in them. And the third thing about this personhood is that we were built for relationships, for relationship with the creator God, for relationships with each other. And it says he created them male and female. He's talking about gender here. Now, unless you live in a cave somewhere and have no access to the outside world, you know that our societies become obsessed with talking about gender. And in reality, it's far less than 1% that we're talking about that it truly affects. But because of social media, because of influence, you know, people are questioning, well, maybe, maybe this is true, maybe I'm like this or not like this. What does God say? Well, God is very clear. A woman is a woman, a man is a man. A woman is made in the image of God just as man, yet a woman is distinct from man given their own identity, and basic to that is genetic structure. The female is an XX chromosome found throughout her whole body, and the male is an XY chromosome found throughout the whole body. Gender is assigned at birth by God, personal God, and is not a social construct nor is it a matter of choice. That's what the Bible says. And the result of this is there are observable physical, biological differences. A woman is hardwired for pregnancy and childbirth, and no man will ever menstruate, get pregnant, or have a child. Those are basic facts. So this past week, Just to see the difference, and I could give you many examples. Up in Maine, uh, a cross-country runner, high school, I believe, was ranked 172nd in the state. He decided to become trans to a woman and enter the woman's category. He's now fourth in the state. Differences, folks. Thousands of years of civilization have everywhere recognized that a man and woman are different, but we've gotten enlightened in the last few decades. Biological male means male, and biological female means female, God's design. And God says, let them rule. We'll look at that when we get to the third part of mankind and God's image. But how did he create them? Well, chapter 2, verse 7 tells us. Then the Lord God formed the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Chapter 1, verse 26 gives the general way of doing it. These are not two different accounts. When we come to chapter 2, verse 7, it's specific. They complement each other. 2, 7 explains 126. The dust 
These physical bodies of ours aren't worth a whole lot. The minerals that make them up, the parts for us any worth aren't worth a whole lot. That's why when we die, eventually decays, right? Now, no matter how intelligent animals might seem to be, hum humanity is different. We are different. We have been created to be in communication with our God. We have ability to communicate with each other, to have thoughts, to make choices that no animal has. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we abuse God's creation, just the opposite. We're called to be even good there. Proverbs 12.10 says, A righteous man has regard for the life of his beast. So God creates man different from animals. He says he formed them. He, it's the idea of a master craftsman. He's like a potter working, at a, working his, his pottery and fine-tuning it. And he breathed, it says, life into them. They were brought into relationship with the living God in a way that animals weren't. Each, created, each person created then and now. They were created suddenly, supernaturally, as a special act of God. Now, man was created originally to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And when the world was created, I believe this is a young earth with the appearance of age. I don't know how old it is, but I don't believe with tens of millions of years old. God created earth with a mature look about it. And then the flood came and changed the topography again. So that means when Adam was created, he wasn't a baby. He didn't evolve, that's first of all, over tens of thousands of years, he was created. And he was created as a mature man. How old he was, I don't know. Trees, when they were created, uh, God didn't create acorns, he created full live oak trees. And this answers the big question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> the chicken. Mature. Then they had eggs. Now, since the fall, though, because chapter 3, sin comes into the world. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. Now, man has to have life, physical life, but he has to be regenerated. The Holy Spirit gives life into a person through faith in Jesus Christ, and they become now alive to the spiritual things of God. And man is the crown of creation. He is the crescendo of all of God's creation. Because he, when I say he, I say that generically, was created in the image of God. Second, mankind was created to propagate life. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth to propagate, to multiply, to reproduce, to fill the earth by Reproduction. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Now, our world, this is under attack right now too, right? Children are either, you know, some physical appendage that doesn't really matter much what you do with it, or they become an inconvenience. But they're not seen as a blessing. They're not seen as something God gives to people, to bless them and to fulfill the earth, a command God has given. Now, each person since then, like Adam, has been created uniquely. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14 says that, that God is the creator, is the potter, weaving together in the mother's womb from the genetics of the, the, the male and the genetics from the female and bringing a new life into existence. He's doing that. And having said that, our world is not coming to an end because of overpopulation. You hear that, oh, there's too many people on the planet, you know, what are we going to do? God's taking care of them. He takes care of them. 
And modern technology can now mass produce food like never before. Let me say one more thing about this propagation. This is one of the reasons why God put a sex drive into people. So the earth could be repopulated quickly and easily. It's not the main reason. The main reason, we'll look at that next week, is that God uh, created sex was to contribute to the bonding of a male and a female. This closeness, this knit them together. So man was created in God's image first. Second, man was created to propagate life, to be fruitful and to multiply. You know, not everybody has to have a, a lot of children. I know things are different than like when I was a kid. When I was a kid, there, were, there was one family that had 21 kids. I mean, you, every, grade, every level of grade school, you have one of the kids in your class, no matter what grade you were in. I, I had twins in my class. Different world today, you know. Things are much more expensive. But, but God, not that every person can, every family can have a child. They can't. But God wants us to be involved with children and the next generation and the next generation and the next You know, we see it long term. Third thing, man was created to rule creation. Chapter 128, and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam was given the first command to rule creation. Now, a couple of things about Adam. I mean, look, Adam, he was amazing. There was no sin yet that affected him. He was, you know, the most brilliant person, I'm sure, who ever lived except for Jesus Christ. Just the capacity God put into him before the fall. What did he do? He named the animals. So when you name something that, that kind of says that you have dominion over it, rule over it. Look at that animal. I, I think I'm going to name that a, a rhinoceros. What about a hippopotamus? I don't know what happened. But Adam named all the animals. Second thing Adam did was that he tended the Garden of Eden. He tended this garden. Now, granted, before sin, no weeds and no scorching hot days. It's amazing how much work you could do when the weather's a little bit cooler, right? So Adam took care of the garden. This was all before the fall. He had the best job any person ever had. But then he blew it. Now, mankind after him, including us today, we're called to have dominion. That implies it, we are the rulers, not a fish, not some, you know, little insect that we can't, you know, maybe bring water, irrigate something because there's a, a little insect that they don't want you to put water on. But nor does it mean that we are to destroy things. We're to be good stewards. God made the earth beneficial for us. And I believe this command is the basis for all advances that mankind has seen. Exploration, when explorers were exploring the world. Scientific explorations, technological explorations for for today, you know, man, God put that in us to know and to keep knowing why we went to the moon, why we go down deep below the sea. That's just put into mankind to have dominion. Now, I think there's a healthy balance right here to respect and subdue to reflect God's glory. Let me, let me give you what I think are two unhealthy views. And again, I'm saying this because this is going to depend on who you are and what you define as healthy or not. But I think unhealthy views is the first one, is to abuse the world and all of our resources for greed, for lusting after more and more and ignoring God. And how this plays itself out is exploiting people, slave labor. We want slaves to do what we want because we want this. I think when, once we get to that point, we've kind of gone too far. I think a second, though, and this is also very prevalent, 
if there's no creator God, there's no personal creator, then the total care of our earth depends entirely on us. This arrogance. You know, we've destroyed everything. You know, we can stop it. We can do this. I remember, you know, over the years, maybe y'all have heard it, that they were going to drop a bomb in hurricanes, and hurricanes were going to stop. Come on. You know, the idea that we, this is it. If we don't do it, there's nothing that can be done. We see this in radical environmental groups. There's this group in Germany called The Last Generation. And they say, we are part of the last generation who still has a chance to stop the complete ecological collapse of Earth, regardless of whether we want it or not. With society's will to survive, we still have two to three years in which we can divert from the path of this fossil fuel-led annihilation. In other words, the world's going to end if we don't address climate change. I think God put fossil fuel part of the natural world that's totally transformed the world in the last 150 years. Totally. But now we're saying it's bad, and now we're saying that the world's going to end if we don't do something. Well, here's what's taking place. As I start, you take God out, the cornerstone, everything else collapses. And so that's what we're seeing happening. And Paul tells us in Romans 1.25, For they exchanged the truth of a God for a lie, the truth that there's one creator, God, eternal, all-powerful. And what did they do? They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And that's what we're seeing right now. People bowing down to the creation. Again, we want to keep healthy balances. But we have a creator, God, who created everything. And he's got everything, keep it in control. We don't want to be foolish. But no, at the same time, that we say, oh, my gosh, if we don't do it, it's over. Now, Jesus kind of demonstrated this at his first coming to some degree. Mark chapter 113, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, it says, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and was with wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Then we see later in his ministry, um, uh, he's got power, dominion over nature. Uh, when he, Luke chapter 5, when, when, when Peter and the, and the apostles come in after being out uh, fishing, Peter, Jesus tells Peter, uh, try the other side of the boat. You'll catch a whole lot more. Peter's like, come on. Okay. You know, thinking to himself, this guy's not a fisherman. They throw it to the other side. What happens? Their nets are busting. Peter falls down, worships Jesus because he realized this is not a, a good fisherman here. This is more than that, more than I bargained for. Um, we see, you know, the rooster going to crow three times before Peter denies. Three times in Jesus, Peter denies Jesus. Jesus knew that. But then when Jesus comes back the second time, we call it the millennial kingdom. Millennial, thousand, six times we read about it in Revelation chapter 20, this reign and all the promises that God had promised to Israel in the Old Testament are going to be fulfilled. We'll look at that sometime next year, 2024. But there, Jesus is going to come reign and rule, and there's going to be harmony again on the earth as far as the lion will lie down with the lamb and a child will play with a cobra and the desert will bloom again and flower again. And so after God creates man, verse 31, he says, everything is very good. And despite the creation which God has fashioned, creation is still good, still good today. Paul writes to Peter in first, I mean, excuse me, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. He tells them again, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God created a good world. He created man and woman as the crown of his creation. 
to rule under him. And we're still there, though that rule has been damaged by sin. God hasn't changed, changed, changed on that. The Roman Empire was declining. The Roman Empire was polytheistic. They believed in a number of gods. Whenever Rome would conquer a country, they wouldn't make the people bow down to their gods. They would just simply incorporate their gods, country's gods, into their pantheon of gods. And all they would ask of the people was, just give a small homage to the emperor. You know, make a sacrifice, burn some incense, something to show that you acknowledge the emperor amongst the other gods. Now, the early Christians, up until the middle of the third century, they were doing fine. But what had happened was Rome started to decline. 200 started to go down. And as Christianity expanded and expanded to all strata of the Roman society, and as the empire on the other side began to decline, people started attributing trouble in the empire to the God the Christians bowed down to. They weren't sacrificing to the old gods. Maybe that's why trouble is taking place. Because in Rome, there was suspicion of these Christians of disloyalty to the state. They met in private. They didn't fulfill the social compact that we should be doing. Rome didn't have a like church that they came to. There was a public temple that you would go to. And it wasn't like we have services here. See, in Rome, the church and state were kind of fused. They were fused together. And so these religious rituals were public. And the Christians, when they were gathered together, of course, they would gather together. They weren't big, but as they expanded, but they would gather together in private worship times. They would celebrate the Lord's table together. They would have feasts together. They would eat together. And so the Roman, especially some of the administrators, began to feel something's happening here that we don't like. You know, these Christians are meeting together for these love feasts, I, I bet they're having sex orgies. And they're eating this bread and drinking this cup. I wonder if they're practicing cannibalism. Suspicion grows. And so they are labeled the threat to the peace and stability of the empire. Finally, the emperor Decius, emperor 249 to 251 AD, he comes up with this plan. And it seemed like a pretty simple plan, but he wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page, that everybody was collective in their thinking. He didn't want anybody going stray, so he had people go from household, and they filled out this reading. I, fill in the blank, have always sacrificed to the gods, and now in your presence I have, in keeping with the directive, sacrifice, and have tasted of the sacrificial victim, and I request that you, a public servant, Certify the same. And so the servant would say, okay, you know, whether it be uh, you, you drank some libation, you know, uh, you drank some wine, you poured some wine out as a libation, you, you, you ate a, a, you burned some incest. And so then it would be certified, yeah, you did it. But some Christians wouldn't do that. Many wouldn't do that. Because they felt, well, we can bend very far. But we can't bend this far. We can't be forced to do something and to declare somebody else Lord other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened was names were taken and the first empire persecution took place, 251 AD. They were troublemakers. That's what they were seeing. But they weren't troublemakers. They just wanted to live in peace. They weren't about politics. They were about worshiping their Lord. But society saw them as intolerant. Come on, you can't go along with this? What's the big deal? 
Another persecution took place later under the Emperor Diocletian, 303 to 311, called the Great Persecution. Churches were burned. Uh, scriptures were taken and burned. People were put to death. And finally, it ended in 311. Now, listen, folks. Today, we just want to be good citizens and worship God in peace. But I, I see more and more pressure coming. Not just to get along. And look, you want to live your life like that? Fine. I don't think it's right, but I, I, I'm not going to try to stop you. I'm not going to come to your house and bang on your door. Live your life as you want. But we're being told more and more, not only do you have to agree with it, but you have to endorse it. You have to celebrate it. So people are saying, you don't need to abandon your faith. Just modify it a little bit, right? Now, we don't want to be seen as intolerant haters. But as I'm looking at this, we must decide what are basic foundational truths I mean, is a man a man and a woman a woman? Or is that up for grabs? And if we don't, what happens? Well, what did the early Christians do? Well, they did what Paul said, told them to do, and I think we're to do the same. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He says this. Be in your guard... Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Five commands that Paul gives to the church at Corinth, you know, like this drill sergeant barking out orders to the church. The first one, be on guard, be watchful, be alert, keep your eyes open. Don't play like nothing bad's happening. Be alert. Second. Stand firm in the faith. Stand firm. Persevere. The faith. The faith is the conviction that God exists as both creator and sustainer of the universe and that this God sent his only son, Jesus, to fully display him to the world. And by faith in him and him only can a person know forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So Paul says, hold tight to your conviction. Third, be courageous. Literally, if some of your versions says, act like a man. Stand up. Give it all you got. Be strong. Be resolute. And then last, do everything in love. The mark of a Christian is we are strong in our convictions, but we do things in love. We're not looking to burn down cities, tear down stuff, ride in the streets. What did Jesus say in John 13, 34 to his disciples? A new commandment I give you that you love one another. By this will all men will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. David Guzik writes this. All the watching, all the standing, all the bravery... All the strength the Corinthian Christians might show meant nothing without love. They were called to do all those things in a meek, humble spirit of love. We are too. Listen, whether we like it or not, God's got us for this present time. We are his people. We are the ones who stand up for basic foundational truth. Not because we're intolerant. Not because we hate people and demand that people act like us. No, never. Never by coercion. But by persuasion. By our attitudes of love. By our standing on what God has said. That we remain salt and light and carry out his will until Jesus returns. We're here for this time, folks. God's called us. Let's pray. Father, we, we do pray for our world. You know, that's become, becoming increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. And we just want to live quiet lives, 
worshiping together, fellowshipping together, studying your word, sharing meals. The world does what it does. And so I pray, Lord, that you make us the kind of people who reflect you, just as the early Christians did. And we don't know what's coming, Lord. The history's in your hands. You're over this, though. And you've put us here for a time like this. So may we be your people as we stand on foundational biblical truths, not ugly, not militantly, but because you said that, and we lovingly obey that. In Jesus' name I pray.